Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor YouTube Live. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune, and it's been an interesting day, Parker. We're going to get to all that. We're going to talk about the DeMarco Murray situation. We're going to talk about spring team and practice intel. We're going to talk about some recruiting updates. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of what's to come for the basketball team. And I guess what's to come, you know, not so much the spring visits uh, plus official visits and on all that right here on this version of the OU insider under the visor YouTube live. But Parker, first we got to take care of some business and pay some bills. Uh, that we do, uh, folks. Don't forget to download the autograph app using the link link.ag.fan slash boomer and the promo code boomer. Completely free. Good way to stay on top of all your sooner news from a multiplicity of sites and writers, including us and ours at OU Insider. And this episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders and below the waist grooming clear out that winter bush with manscapes lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust manscaped with our special offer. the now the lawnmower 5.0 ultra folks is a fifth generation trimmer that features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads it also features dual led spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris Navigate with confidence in your delicate areas. Now, hate making a mess? Not to worry. This bad boy is waterproof. Shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean. I love this thing because it comes with a compact case. You can take it with you everywhere you go. And spring cleaning doesn't just apply to the nether regions. You can get the full grooming experience with Manscaped's signature beard hedge or pro kit and the handyman electric face shaver. So whether you're looking to craft your signature look or clean up that neckline, these are always the right tools for the job. You can get 20% off and free shipping with the code OUinsider at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code OUinsider at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. Okay. There we go. Um... Spring clean it is. It is by the way, it is spring break. So I know that yes, you know, everybody is out and about. Uh I you can completely tell by just who's watching and how many like spring break is upon us. Everybody's out having fun, doing their thing. I know most people are on vacation at this point with their kids, all that. So I hope you guys are out having fun. And those that are watching us at a later time, I hope you guys are being safe. And enjoying yourself on this spring break 2024. All right, Parker. Um, man. <laughs> so we talked about on our podcast just yesterday when we recorded it. Uh, the Marco Murray, we can't see him going anywhere. Yeah. We released that podcast. And within a 12-hour period, that thing was a damn roller coaster behind the scenes. And I talked to some sources really, really close to that situation. And I don't, nobody was really worried, worried because just the hesitancy that well, DeMarco had at the time, but they did say, look, like it is what it is. It will really suck. If DeMarco leaves, it will be a big blow to the coaching staff. So the to the program uh but they're in talks this that's why i kept getting told they're in talks oklahoma yeah. and him are in contract talks so it's far from over they feel they can get it done is what everybody kept saying so we never really discussed it much more than that because it almost felt like this whole time it was and i said this from the beginning and i know you kind of did too that it was it was a power play by DeMarco. And, you know, we talked about the money aspect and all that. Yeah. He was a top five running back coach pay wise, top six, I believe. But let's be honest. The dude is probably a top two or three running back coach in the country. Maybe, you know, him and Tony Alford can sit there and argue who's the best, mm -hmm. I believe. And those two really 
uh, they can they can garner a lot of money. And so I, I always said seven fifty plus would probably keep Demarco because of his love of university, and that's kind of what I've been hearing is that's where that thing's probably headed. Well, and he, here were and here are my thoughts on the whole saga. One, as we talked about, Demarco had interviewed for and been a consideration for multiple jobs over the last yeah, few NFL years elsewhere, and everything. at the collegiate yeah. level and at the NFL level. It was never really a concern of mine that DeMarco Murray was going to leave Oklahoma because mm-hmm. on the one hand, why would Ohio state be any different than all the other jobs that he had turned down up until this point? Yeah. And also, uh, yeah, he's going to get a raise. Good for him. I, m- my impression of this situation is that for DeMarco, it's less about the money and more about the loyalty because yes. you know you <laughs> with how much money DeMarco has bankrolled from his time in the NFL an extra 200 250,000 dollars a year yeah that's something but is that a huge dent for him financially is that a windfall not by any means relative to his portfolio of wealth but in it's your worth exactly in engaging with Ohio State to whatever extent he engaged with them. I think what you're asking Oklahoma to do is prove to me that you want me here. Mm -hmm. Show me that. Show me that you're loyal to me the way that I've been loyal to you. And obviously Oklahoma accommodated DeMarco as they were always going to do, right? When you're a campus legend like DeMarco Murray is, if he picks up the phone and tells the administration, Hey, I need an extra $200,000 or I would like an extra $200,000. What do you think they're going to do? You think they're going to haggle with him? You think they're going to be like, eh, eh, I don't really feel like you're no, he's freaking DeMarco Murray. He's going to get what he wants. And he did in this case and yeah. everybody wins. And I will say, I will say this props to the OU administration because this off season, there has not really been substantial smoke about Bill Biedenboe leaving for Alabama, Todd Bates leaving for Auburn, or even DeMarco Murray leaving for Ohio State, and not because those schools didn't reach out and try to poach those assistants, but Correct. because OU shut it down very quickly before that thought could even take root. Yeah, it's been it, – look, you're moving into the SEC. You you need to pay your assistants SEC money, particularly your top assistants, and I get like – Look, DeMarco Murray came in and he was very, he was lightly paid when he arrived, right? Um, He's been now, this will be year number four at the University of Oklahoma. And so he's, he's built up sweat equity. And with that sweat equity, whether it's on the field or whether it's in the coaching room, right? You, you, you need your worth. And at that point, DeMarco proved that he could recruit at an elite level and he can develop at an elite level. Like Eric Gray had career year underneath him. Kennedy Brooks, career year underneath him, right? Um, you just saw the development of these running backs. Stalchuk at the end of last year was one of the better running backs in college football. And so everybody looks, and I know that there's some that sit there and they're like, well, Look at the running back room. Look how it struggled the first half of last year. Look, DeMargo could not control the injuries. Barnes' knees, hamstring with Salchuk, ankle with uh, Tawi Walker. Your top three running backs were off and on with injuries over the first half of the season. Salchuk got healthy, and you just saw that running back room springboard at that point, right? It became consistent. You knew you could lean, lean on it because your workhorse was healthy. The guy that DeMarco had developed was healthy. And so going into this year, not only do you have Salchuk healthy, you have Barnes healthy. You've got the number one running back in the country and Taylor Tatum coming in. you got the top running back in the state of Oklahoma, right? Xavier Robinson, who I think is severely underrated. He's already down to 228. He looks like a freaking animal out there. Um and you, you just – so you're you're good there. You got Caleb Hicks, one another four-star running back. Uh, you got one of the top – Juco, one of the top, what, 30, 40, 50 Juco players in the country and Sam Franklin to come in. And that was at every position, right? He well, ran for portal, 1,400 yards. Juco. Portal. I, I meant portal. That's what I meant. Sorry. Portal. Um, And, and it just 
look, he's he's built a room that is insane. And yeah, you know, I I I was sent and I, I kind of put it in our group stuff, right? And I sent out what some of the Ohio State people were saying, right? Like, oh, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, Chip Kelly putting his arm around, you know, DeMarco Murray, and it'll be done. I know you saw it when I sent that because I freaking died how, when I read that. How absurd that. is that? Oh, yeah. It'll when be I was... over when they put their arm around DeMarco Murray. Yeah, well, hey, so listen, buddy, buddy. I what I what I was told by a very good source that I know has plenty of connections <laughs> on both the Oklahoma side and the Ohio State side is that, DeMarco Murray does not like Chip Kelly. <laughs> they are not on exceedingly jovial terms. I heard similar. Um, I, I can't confirm it though, but I've heard similar. And, and the it just, it just was funny the arrogance and just the idea. And well, they're coming into it. DeMarco will be coming into the room, and it's the other the other the other statement that I just about died laughing was he'll finally play for a contender, a legitimate contender in college football. Like what? Like what world are we living in, Parker, where Oklahoma isn't a contender seven out of ten years most most times, right? Like this is just the utter arrogance on one side was was crazy. And then we're sitting over here going, talking to everybody. And they're like, yeah, he's not going to go in. They're going to negotiate and it's going to be done. Now, did it get close? Was he, was he listening? And was there a point in time where DeMarco really considered Ohio state? And I I don't want to sit here and say leaning towards Ohio state, because I think that would be an exaggeration of the situation. What I would like, what I would probably say was it, it became a possibility. And a legitimate well, possibility. Let me right? let me ask you this, Brandon. If <laughs> is DeMarco Murray leaving for Ohio State if Oklahoma well, I, okay. If they don't pay, yeah, I think you would. Well, sure, well but, but sure, like if Oklahoma does anything, anything beyond just completely blowing off his request for a raise, is DeMarco Murray leaving for Ohio State? Because I to me the answer is no. Well, there was as there, long as there's there's family stuff that that was considered in that, and that was I what I was told was the wife had lived in an area down here away from, and she's got a lot of family up in o, that Ohio region. I I don't remember exactly where, but I was just specifically said that Ohio region. She's got a lot of connections, a lot of family, so it made sense, and that's where it was kind of that type of deal. And I don't, and that's great and all right. But you also have to take in consideration that a lot of his wife's friends are now here in Oklahoma after four years, their kids friends are here in Oklahoma after four years, right? Like there is a lot to sift through if you were to Marco, because I don't, like you said, money wasn't the end all. It was, that was the tangible way for OU to show his worth. And I don't, I think that was the only way they could do it. And so with Ohio state throwing the money that they did at him, Oklahoma had to ante up and they did. And again, like you said, props, props to the administration, props to just that whole situation, because it could have really went sideways and the worst part is, is DeMarco Murray's legacy would have been hurt in it. In that situation, it probably wouldn't have been DeMarco Murray's fault. Like if the university is not going to ante up and show, you know, pay him his worth and show the loyalty to him, how much more loyal could he be? You know, four or five years playing and four years coaching, how much more loyal could somebody be? before you show your loyalty back. Right. Yeah. So a good, good on the administration for doing what they needed to do. So anyways, um, on that note, it, it could have turned really sideways in 25, right? <laughs> because it sounds like DeMarco right before all this happened, seemed to have some good news tweeted well, out Yamaha. It's and so then funny, everything kind of went crazy. 
because NOU Insider VIPs know this. I reported this over the weekend, uh, but I saw Tory Blaylock on Sunday, and a lot of us in the media ended up talking to him, you know, kind of discussing the situation and where things are at in his recruitment. And, you know, I'm, I'm standing off to the side waiting to go one on one with him because the conversation I wanted to have with him, you know, I didn't want to put a microphone or a camera in his face or anything like that. I just want to talk to him. But he's doing his series of interviews. And one of the folks that he ends up talking to is our rivals, Mid South national analyst, Marshall mm-hmm. Levinson. And Marshall asks him, So what's the timeline on your commitment? And Tori said, Honestly, it could be any time. Could be tomorrow. Could be months from now. <laughs> as soon as, as soon as he goes, could be tomorrow. That's kind of your first. Good, like, okay, okay. He he pretty much knows where he's going. Then come to find out, he's got one official visit set. One, I'll mm-hmm. give you one guess. June twenty first through the twenty third. He couldn't even that that kid ran it. He could not even remember all the schools that made up his top six when I talked to him. And so he would like, he would like, he was not going to own up to the fact that he was Yamaha. Uh, He was not going to give any indication, but all the signs were there. Right. And then he comes out last night and drops that commitment day, March 29th. And it's, it's pretty easy to connect the dots here. You can expect that uh, next Friday, DeMarco Murray is going to get on the board with his first and probably only take in the class of 2025. And rightfully so. And then I don't, I don't know that it's going to take much longer in 26. If he does what I think he's going to do and he goes and pushes for Rylan Morris, I think it's, I think it's done. Like, I think it like, Oh, you look, he's already got Hatton until right. Rylan Morris, I've been told by numerous people around Rylan Morris that OU is verifiably his number one school. Can I ask a question? Go for it. Let's say OU does push for Rylan Morris. Where does that leave Caden Jones? As an athlete, because he can do a lot. Yes, he can play corner. I... He can play he. He actually likes corner a lot. I know that he plays running back. He likes corner a lot. Uh, he could play slot. He can play. He could be. He could be, kind of the. What's the word? Uh, just kind of the the. He could play everywhere. I guess is the best way to put it. You could line him in the slot. You could line him, you know, at running back. You could have two running backs at once and motion him out and do all kinds like he is that good but at the same time i see where you're coming from because he and rylan play a play a very similar type of game yeah Um, but i and but the thing is is that when you talk to people around caden jones and whether you want to believe it or not i don't think i really do they're like yeah it's not guaranteed to go to you okay yeah no and he's like to be fair he has been adamant about that as well yeah, but sometimes when you F around, you find out, right? Like, and oh, you will <laughs> go may- take something else. Yeah, well, and, you know, that's kind of why I asked the question, because I, I think that's a legitimate possibility, too. Like, Rylan Morris. I, I don't know board. who to take between those two. I mean, I think, I think, I'll say this, I think Caden Jones is special, because I think he legitimately could be a top 250 cornerback at the same time. <laughs> like, he's that good at corner, man. He's special. So, do you think... Caden Jones would play cornerback in college. If OU just up and decided we're going to play a corner, do you think he would do it if Rylan Morris beat him to the punch, committing in twenty six? And by the way, this is all hypothetical, so don't take this as well. Here, yeah, and here's here's my thought on that. Would Caden Jones be willing to play corner if OU was the school he really truly wanted to be? I think about Gentry Williams, right? And oh, Gentry Williams. Oh, you was where Gentry Williams wanted to be, regardless of what position he played. Is Caden Jones, or I, I, I guess maybe the way to ask it is this: Is being at OU more important than any positional preference you may have? In Caden Jones's case, I don't know the answer. 
I know. He's been very, very strange about it. He and his dad have been kind of different about it, right? Like, yeah, it, it's it, but it is what it is. I mean, I, I, I like both. I do <laughs> like well, be, and I'll be honest, you know, I, I think, like both. I think the conversation regarding running backs in 2026 is much akin to the conversation surrounding safeties in 2025, which is to say. If you get Jonah Williams and you get Marcus Wimberly, does it kind of suck that at that point you don't have room for Amari and Robinson? Yeah, mm -hmm. but you got two studs, and so you're not gonna like you're not gonna lose sleep over that. You're not gonna lose sleep over the guy you didn't get or didn't have room for. You're gonna be stoked about the two guys that you do have, and I think that's where you're at. If you get Jonathan Hatton and Rylan Morris, both of whom are top 150 players in the nation. Yeah. Totally agree. I think you, if you if you can look Rylan Morris, I watched him run routes this past weekend at that uh DR7 event in Tulsa. And I've said this before, everything about him screams a sl more slender version of DeMarco Murray. Like he walks like I even showed Hoover. I was like he walks the same, stands the same, has the exact same everything of DeMarco, runs routes the same, moves the same in space. Like it's like they both have like they walk on their toes with their toe with their feet out. Like it's very weird how similar they are in so many physical attributes that I was like, it's just perfect. It's a perfect fit. And the kid absolutely loves DeMarco and loves Oklahoma. Like he wants to be a sooner at this point. So I think when you look at that, it to me, I I I I would be comfortable putting in a pick for Rylan Morris if I, I knew it. If I knew oh, that Hayden Jones was if I could if I could get a better better feel of what what he's thinking because he's kind of an enigma right now. As far as, you know, what he wants to do and the way he's been going through his recruiting process. There was a question in here I thought was an interesting one. Um, oh, my gosh. It was up here. It was about Evers. Um, oh, it's, so is Christopher Moon. I'm going to let you. So is OU a sneaky watch for Drew Evers? Yes. Uh, Levy's gone. The disdain that they had for the offensive side of the ball after the, what everything happened with their son, Nick. Um, Venables, they love. Beat and Bow, they love. Latrell, they love. DeMarco, they love. Everybody on that offensive staff. The Evers family really loved, except for one guy. And you have to understand that that situation and the reasoning for it. Like it, it makes sense. So now that Latrell is in charge and Joe John's in charge of the offense, yeah, I really do think I, I might even sit here and look you straight in the eye and say, yeah, I think Oklahoma leads for Drew Evers right now. I think Texas A&M with the family connection is the one team that I could see making a play for it for Evers at this juncture. But man, he's looked good at everything, whether it was OU camp, Under Armour camp. He's been really, really good in those performances. And that's why he jumped up so high. Number 27 overall. Yeah, deservedly so, by the way. Deservedly so. This is not me sunshine pumping because I've been told this by national folks as well. OU is in the driver's seat for Drew Evers. They do. Like, they lead yep. that race. Now, whether that lead holds, I don't know if I'm comfortable projecting that right now. Um, and it's going to be a problem. Yep. Yeah. And it, well, not, and not just, I, I don't really think it's going to be AM as much as some of the SEC powerhouses because. Uh, mom's an A&M alum, sure, but Drew, you know, and I was, I got to talking to Derek, Drew's dad, 
at mm-hmm. the Under Armour camp in Dallas. And, you know, we've, we've known those folks for a long, long time now. Oh yeah. Great so people. Yep. Always, always good to catch up with them. And you no, know, Derek was super frank about it. He was like, look, he wants to visit LSU. He wants to visit Georgia. He wants to visit Tennessee. We'll probably go all three of those places in the spring and we'll see where things fall from there. So there's a lot of time and a lot of space for things to change, but Oklahoma was early to the table in offering Evers last summer uh, following his freshman year. Uh, they weren't, they weren't his first offer. I don't think they were even in his first handful of offers, but still in, in the grand scheme of things, when you consider the the true big boys in a recruitment like that, Oklahoma was still earlier than most. So that's going to go a long way. And mm-hmm. I, I, you, you said it, Brandon, they have a ton of love for everybody that is currently at OU. <laughs> The one guy at OU that they had issues with is no yep. longer there. Yep. So, yeah, it all checks out. Yeah. yeah I, 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 look, Oklahoma. It, okay, I'm going to let you pronounce the, the, the 25 offensive linemen from Elgin. I'll let you pronounce the name because I don't want to butcher it. Anthony Ogumaro. That is why. See, this is why I leave it up to Parker. Because I will butcher it the first time I say it. So, Ogumaro. So, I won't butcher it now. Anthony Ogumaro. Okay. So, just moved to Elgin, Oklahoma. Yep. Obviously, family, probably military, I would assume, with the location of Elgin and just how fast that town has been growing due to Lawton. It, and I believe. I can't remember the other town down there that's growing really fast, but both of them are now close to being five, a schools, I believe uh, just really, really fast growing towns. Ogumaro came in and within two weeks got invited to visit Oklahoma and then picked up an offer. Yep. Where people want an update, where, where does that stand? Cause you're the one that talked to him. I have not spoken to the kid yet. He's an awesome kid, man. Awesome kid with an awesome story. Uh, He is from Saipan, which is an island in the northern Mariana island chain, all the way out in the West Pacific. If you know where Guam is, Saipan is just a little bit northeast of Guam. Uh, Literally, like a very, very small island, something like 65 square miles in the middle of the ocean. That's where he's from. Uh, military family obviously he's bounced around most recently lived in North Carolina for a while before his family moved to Elgin and they're hoping that this is the last stop for them Uh, what is interesting is that yes he was born in Saipan but he also spent a good deal of time growing up in Hawaii where he connected with Dylan Gabriel's family coincidentally enough and is very very good friends with Dylan Gabriel's younger brother Roman they grew up playing basketball together. And so cool. he already followed Oklahoma football for Dylan's sake before he moved to the state of Oklahoma. So he is like he has a general familiarity with everything that OU is. And uh, he he was very transparent with me in the conversation that we had last week. I talked to some folks on the OU side uh, that gave me perspective as well. Everything just kind of fits with him mm-hmm. and OU everything just kind of fits and no, I don't think it's going to affect Oklahoma's pursuit of the top tackles in the club. Now I do think like if you feel better about where things stand with Fasusi and Lamont Rogers and guys like, do, like, do you offer a guy like Ogumaro in that case? Maybe not. He does project to the inside more than at tackle. So, uh, it's not it, it's not necessarily like a one for one replacement. Like, oh, they're not getting Michael Susie, so let's take this kid from Elgin. But obviously, you do have to be mindful of overall numbers in the offensive line room. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think he winds up in Oklahoma's class right now. I have entered a future cast to that effect. Uh, I look. I don't think the Sooners are getting Fasusi. I don't think they're getting nope. Lamont Rogers at this juncture. Nope. Ty Haywood and Andrew Babalola. Yeah, there's a shot. Those are the two guys you got a shot with. And look, like you're going to have a shot at Fasusi. You're going to have a shot at Rodgers. You're going to get those guys on campus for an OV. 
I'm just like knowing some of the things I know about what is on the table for them elsewhere, not holding my breath, not holding my yeah. breath at all. But Haywood, Babalola, yes, you got a shot with those two. Ogumaro, you flip on the tape, he's pretty brand new to the game of football. He's only played for two years, 6'5, 290. Looks the part of an offensive lineman, not a ton of physical development that needs to happen there. He's strong. He's got good punch, quick on his feet for uh, being a guy that is that. Well, and I guess pretty technically sound for being a guy that is that new to the game of football. Uh, obviously, I, I think when you watch him, you conclude that, yes, there is some work to be done. Yes, he does need to refine some things, but his raw ability is really enticing. So, Oklahoma is going to have to ward off the likes of North Carolina and Kansas state. Uh, Tennessee is another school that was recruiting him really hard. But again, I think everything that OU's about mm -hmm. very much fits everything that Agumaro and his family are about. And so I think OU is going to be tough to deny in that race, real tough. So let, let's make it clear. Like you, like you said, Aunt Babalola and uh, obviously Ty Haywood, totally agree. I think Oklahoma has a very decent shot, if not really good shot with both of them. I just, we've just, and I'll reiterate what, what you said. I With Lamont Rogers and Fasusi, if you asked me a month ago if I thought Fasusi was going to be in this class, probably would have told you yes. But since that time, Missouri, look, it's not that Oklahoma isn't going to play the NIL game. They're just not going to be stupid about it. And that 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 is the difference. Like programs like Missouri, and I know Missouri fans are going to hate on this, and they hate when people say this because they take offense. And good, take offense to this. I'm just going to tell you the facts of the matter. Texas. Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Oklahoma, uh, Clemson don't have to throw around money the way those other programs do to get the players' attention because they have this thing called NFL first-rounders in development that have happened over the last decade plus, and that holds a lot of weight when you do this game. Now, a lot of kids – Love the upfront money. Families love the. It all depends on the the kid, right? And all the pan, depend depends on the family situation. But a lot of times, those kids take less with those pure blue blood programs than they do to go to A and M or Missouri or. Am, am I am I speaking facts, Parker? You are speaking facts. It, they do. And I, I published a story today with an interview that I did a week and a half ago in Dallas with Owen Hollenbeck, who is, of course, one of OU's two offensive line commits. And with regard to the fact that Bill Bedenbo sent three dudes to the NFL Combine, the Sooners only three representatives at the NFL Combine, mind you, mm -hmm. uh, last month, I asked him, like, hey, what, what, what does that say to you? <laughs> he goes, big green flags that not as many people are picking up on as they should, which was kind of, you know, it, it kind of hinted at what's going on in the recruitments of those big time offensive tackles down in the DFW area. He, he laughed later on. I asked him about the and Haywood and uh, Lamont Rogers specifically. And he was like, yeah, you know, they're, they're kind of being stubborn, but we're doing everything we can to get them on board. Uh, the, I think the point is the point I want to make is that, would you like to have a five-star type of dude that Bill Biedenboe can mold? Absolutely. But are you going to bend over backwards to make that happen based on what Biedenboe has done in years past with guys who were not highly regarded as recruits? No. The one five-star that Bill Biedenboe has ever landed at the University of Oklahoma is in the conversation for biggest Texas state. Like, in the conversation for biggest bust of the 21st century on the recruiting trail for Oklahoma. So that alone tells you that even a five-star is not a sure thing when it comes to offensive line. And I think what Hollenbeck said, another thing that he said over the course of that interview really rung true, which is you got to trust it. 
you got to trust mm-hmm. everything that beaten is trying to do with you as an offensive lineman. And we can dive w- way into why Bray Walker didn't pan out uh, later on down the line, but basically like Bray Walker was Bray Walker's biggest obstacle. That's, that's really what yeah. it boiled down to, but the guys that have gotten to Oklahoma and fully bought in to everything that beaten has tried to impress upon them. Those are the guys that have gone places. Tyler Guyton was a defensive lineman in high school that had two collegiate offers, TCU and SMU. He went to TCU for two years, played some offensive tackle, played some tight end. Mm -hmm. He was not a full-time starter when he left TCU. He gets to Oklahoma, sits a year behind Wanya Morris. For one season and one season only, he takes over as a full-time starter, and now he's a first-round NFL draft pick. That is development. And similarly for Walter Rouse, is he a guy that's going to the NFL combine if he decides to cash in his chips last year after four years at Stanford? No way. But one year with Bill Biedenboe was enough to make him a folk hero for that block that enabled Dylan Gabriel to fire the ball to Nick Anderson and beat Texas and also gets him into the NFL combine. Andrew Rame, Oklahoma kid, homegrown. Mm-hmm. Bill Beatenbo recruited him from his freshman year in high school. And Oklahoma was where he wanted to go. It was kind of always home for him. He gets to campus, starts for three years at Oklahoma. And could he have improved his draft stock by coming back for another season? Absolutely. But the fact that he felt comfortable and could feel comfortable in cashing it in, going to the league a year early. Again, development. That is development. And Bill Biedenboe is going to develop whoever he gets. He's not going to take guys that he doesn't feel like he can't develop. Mm -hmm. And he, end of the day, he doesn't care what the rankings say or what the rating, he doesn't care what anybody else thinks of the guys that he takes. Ultimately, he takes those guys because he sees potential in them. And time and again, he's proven that he doesn't necessarily need a top of the line blue chip talent to make an NFL player, to mold an NFL player. Ben Powers, Cody Ford, Orlando Brown. Um, it's so many guys that he's had over the years that and they weren't without attention as recruits, but nobody had them in the same conversation as the elites, the ones that would command close to seven figures right now if they right. were coming out in the NIL era. Well, Orlando Brown was going to Tennessee until he had some uh, great issues that with the SEC rules. So you being in the SEC now would not be getting Orlando Brown, luckily, right, on National Signing Day. Because I remember covering that. And I remember you announcing Orlando Brown, and we're all looking around going, say, What? Just happened, and we're having to like make um, making phone calls. I remember picking up the phone and calling somebody in the Switzer Center, like, "Yeah, he just didn't qualify for the SEC." And they called us to ask if we would let him, we would take him, and we said, "Hell yes!" <laughs> so, oh, gosh, <laughs> I and somehow, and yet somehow, Missouri makes it work because I, I I won't mention any names, but <laughs> there was an offensive lineman a few classes back that Oklahoma offered and then very quickly realized, Oh, we can't take this kid. We have to stop recruiting this kid because his GPA was atrocious. Like the type of GPA where he should not have qualified anywhere. Yeah. He qualified in Missouri. Well, you alter stuff. What? Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. I don't know. This is a joke. People choke, choke, choke. Uh, all right. So in the comments, there's several of the people that have been saying, so OU's not going to end up with a five-star in this class as far as offensive linemen go. We're sitting here on March 20th, 2024, the year of our Lord, right? Sure. What does OU end up with a five-star? I say they end up with one. I, I think so too, yeah. because – I think they will get either Haywood or Babalola. I am not going to mm-hmm. count right now on them getting both. Agreed. But I think they will get one. And I think that's because the pipe dream has been put to bed. Right? The pipe dream of getting 
two guys of that caliber. And I had both in my first prediction. Yeah, yeah. Fasusi yeah. and Roger. Yeah, like we were drinking that Kool Aid for a while until the. No, oh, I I had Babalola and Fasusi. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, now the numbers are flying and <laughs> you're just, you're not going to be able to afford no. two of those guys. Correct. Well, okay. Well, uh, you'll be able, you, you could afford two of those guys. You're not going to pay for two of those guys. Correct. You'll pay for one. You'll pay for one. And then you'll take Hollenbeck and Foje. And then I think probably a Goomer row down the line. And that's a solid class. That's a really good class. All of those guys should be blue chippers by the end of it. Um, and Foje could very well push for top 50 status. He's that good. Um, yeah. but, but if they take a fifth, who would it be? If they took a fifth? I mean, Riker obviously. Half maybe down the line? Obviously, if a guy like Babalola says, I don't freaking care about the money. I want to play for Bill Beaton, though. You're not going to turn that kid away. But I I don't know that they take a fifth. I think they What about probably- Blake Cherry? I don't hate those two up at Owasso, man. Blake Cherry and Riker Half, they're good ball players. Blake Cherry's been getting some all first. Boy. But here, here, here's kind of where I stand on it. You look at that depth chart right now at Oklahoma, you have eight guys on the roster right now. Eight guys mm-hmm. that have all four years of eligibility left. So at what point do things get too crowded? I think four is So you don't like depth, depth, Parker? Is that what you're saying? I do like depth, and that's what I'm saying. You've got plenty of it. Don't overdo it. Don't stockpile when you could better allocate those scholarships to other positions across the board. So I think four is plenty. I think four is the ideal number. I know they are open to taking five. My thought is you take four, and you'd be done with it, but they are open to taking five if it's the right five. And... As I see it right now, I think the class ends up being Foje, Hollenbeck, Ogumaro, and either Haywood or Babalola. I'm not sure which mm. yet. I agree with that. I I lean towards Haywood right now, but uh, I'll say this. I, when I told you about the conversation I had and who I had it with, it was more about DeMarco than anything else, and it was more about, okay, you know, I'm in Arkansas right now. Do, does Oklahoma have anybody they – they are highly interested in in that state on the um, – everybody knows the defensive guys on the offensive side of the ball, and the source was like, well, not really, but um, – and then all of a sudden, Babalola got – the name just got kind of thrown out there. And so I was like, okay, well, um, how do you feel? And there is some intriguing confidence – with that recruitment, which I I know that we talked about that a few months ago. It just feels like you and I both kind of felt like, okay, well, right now, if this is for the predicted class, we would have him in the class, but maybe later on down the line, that's not the case because confidence may start to wane, right? Well, it hasn't. It's continued. It's actually gotten a little bit stronger as time gone has gone on with that one. So um, I, I – Haywood and Babalola, it's going to be a very, very, very interesting. Both of those <laughs> super interesting when official visits start to roll around, how those pan out, because that's where the NIL discussions start to be had. Yes. And folks, we are not naive yeah. to how quickly things can turn yep. with a premier offensive tackle solely based off of NIL. So in Correct. all likelihood, you are not going to see a remotely speculative prediction from me or Brandon Mm -hmm. at any time. You're not going to see us float a forecast where we're, where we're counting on Oklahoma sustaining the momentum. No, like if you, if you see a forecast for Babalola or Haywood, that's more than likely because it is done, done. Yeah. One of those guys is a sooner. Absolutely. Um, that's why we With never the- enter predictions for Rodgers or for because, like, believe me, Oklahoma was in great shape for the longest time for Fasusi to the point where I was told by a couple people, like, he's he's recruiting for OU, like, he's telling mm-hmm. people OU's the move, trying to get them along with him. And well, even then, there was some reticence because of exactly what we've seen unfold, which is another school comes in and sweetens the pot a little bit, and at that point. 
it gets real tough to uh to battle back have you have you filled out your bracket yet i have i haven't even looked at it yet so really I'm doing it tonight with my kid so both my kids were all gonna sit down and fill them out and uh or both my boys i'm wondering who's gonna win tomorrow that we just don't expect at all because there's always that i'm one so team. excited there's always that one team by the end of day one that has completely not necessarily wrecked brackets Re- bra- brackets don't usually get completely wrecked until the round of 32 but there is that one team that'll pull an out of nowhere upset it's never the ones that you expect which is why mm-hmm. like everybody's saying mcneese is going to beat gonzaga samford's going to beat kansas i'm not drinking the kool-aid on either of those two um it's going to be like watch it'll be like a moorhead state or somebody like that who do you have winning it all houston i have houston over yukon in the national mm-hmm. championship game houston and yukon to me are easily the two best teams in the sport how right far now. do you have iowa state going I have Iowa State. I believe I have them out in the Sweet 16 at the hands of BYU. Yeah, I'll probably have them in the Elite Eight at least. They're so good. Like, shockingly good. Like, I, well, you watch Oklahoma just beat them, just handled them in Norman, and then all of a sudden, they're beating the crap out of everybody, even on the there road. Are always, there are always teams, though that because of their reputation, I have to treat with a degree of skepticism. In yeah, March. they always such choke teams, in the state tournament. Yeah, yeah, such teams include Iowa State, Purdue, any team coached by Rick Barnes. And so Arizona would be another one. All I can go back to is two seed, I think it was 2000, 2001, Marcus Pfizer, um, in Iowa State, they were so good. They were supposed to be this, supposed to be that, and they end up going out to Hampton. <laughs> Hampton University beat them as a 15 seed in the first round of the NCAA tournament. It was a big, big deal. So, um, on that note, transfer portal basketball. Does Oklahoma end up with Brandon Garrison? We talked about on the podcast if Oklahoma could just get Garrison to go with Dayton Forsythe, and if they can keep, if they can keep JV on McCollum and just one other guy, if they can somehow keep a Uzan or or an Oway or something to that ilk, right? They could be really good next year. Well, especially because they got to get a big guy. If you can retain Javian McCollum and you can find a way to tweak the offense such that it doesn't have to run through McCollum and he can just be the sharpshooter, the spot up guy that Emoji Gibson was for a couple mm-hmm. years at Oklahoma, that gets me excited. Uh, Cause I, I, well, I'll put it this way. I think what made Mo Gibson dangerous at Oklahoma was that the offense didn't have to run through him. The Sooners had other weapons that they could yes, count on. they did. And made things easier for him. That's not really the case right now because J.V. McCollum is the only guy. Like, Latre Darthard's capable of stepping out and hitting one every now and again. Jalen Moore can spot up. But J.V. McCollum is the guy that you're primarily accounting for on the perimeter. And so... I getting a big is going to be so, so crucial because that is the one thing that the Sooners have lacked for the longest freaking time, man. And if they can shore that up, if they can have a guy that can throw elbows in the paint and make it such that you don't have to heat up from beyond the arc in order to hang with one of the better teams in your conference, then I think there's a lot to be excited about for OU basketball next year. And I, I think Dayton Forsyth is going to pretty immediately make a dent for this program. That kid is agreed. Good. Agreed. He's special. Like we talked about on the podcast, he, they went up to Illinois, played in these big national tournaments, but they're small school, high school team. And they were working over some of the top teams in the country just because he was so good. If, if again, if he played at like Tulsa union, if he played at Carl Albert, Dell city, 
even if you played a Bishop McGinnis, that dude would be, or, or like a Mustang or something like that, he would be one of the top 100 players in the country. Without question. It, there's, and it's always players like him that can shoot from everywhere that when it gets time for NCAA tournament, they somehow get hot and they're the reasons why teams make runs. Right. And I, I made this analogy in comparison to Steph Curry. He plays a lot like Steph Curry. He does. There is so much similarity in their games. Now I I'm, he's not the next Steph Curry. That's no, you know, you know who he is though. I, I went back and I'll give you credit. You made this comparison on the podcast. I went back after we got off the podcast the other day and I watched some old Rodney Clark highlights. Yeah, he is Rodney Clark of better yep. handles. Yep. 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 That's Aiden Forsyth. Yep. And you'll take that all day, every day, if you're OU. And Particularly with the too. yeah, and the because those Arkansas teams that Rodney Clark Clark played for, he they weren't very talented, right? They 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 had deficiencies. If you get a Brandon Garrison in there and JV McCollum, and you have those three out there in the court, yikes. For the other team, yikes, man, that's a problem, dude. That is a problem. But you got to go land, JV. you got to go land Brandon Garrison. I think our guy Brody Lusk has said that OU probably the leader right now, but Kansas is Bill Self and Kansas always a problem. Yeah, and come. by the way, folks, it is Brody Lusk season at yes, OUinsider.com. That dude is on top of everything regarding the portal and the inner workings of the OU basketball program. So if that is impressive. something you're curious about, like it is very impressive how on top of things he is. And you know this, if you followed throughout the season, he's had injury information that nobody else has had. He's had team notes that nobody else has had over on OUinsider.com. So he's plugged mm-hmm. in. He knows everything that's happening. And he's got a very active portal thread up and running. Brandon Garrison is one of the guys that he's talked about prominently. And so I'll have to touch base with Brody, see how things are trending in that Garrison recruitment. But that'd be huge if Oklahoma could land Garrison because that would be – that's a guy that has the potential to be Oklahoma's first dominant big man. And how long, Brandon? Like how long since they had a real player down low? I mean, they've had guys in past years who have been above average. Like Kadeem Latin was good at times. Um, Christian Doolittle wasn't really a big guy, but like he could get you some stuff inside. Brandon Garrison. I forgot about him. He was a good player. Who's that now? Doolittle was a good player. Oh, yeah, he was. Um, he got screwed by COVID that last mm-hmm. year. Well, that whole team did. They were getting hot at the end. Yeah. With Austin Reeves. And like, ooh, they would. I think that team would have made a run. Um, uh, Austin Reeves could have been a March legend that year. Yes, he would have been. We'll never know. Yep. Um, man, he got hot. He was scoring like 40 points. People, man. Yeah, he dropped 41 on TCU, their very last game of that yep, season. He hit a buzzer beater. Yep, yeah. that's right. That's right. Oh, by the way, real quickly, I know this is kind of off topic, but our uh, Cameron, Fo- uh, Cameron Foster is, I guess he was going back to the previous conversation with, we were talking about, Rylan Morris and Caden Jones, right? And he compared Caden Jones to Percy Harvin. I kind of like that comparison as far as stature, thickness, the ability to run routes, the ability to catch out of the backfield, the ability to uh, break tackles. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I like that comparison. Twitchiness in space. I like that comparison a lot. Uh, Ryan Spangler was the last good oh, you big man, and I kind of agree with that. 2016. He was he was kind of, I guess. He was a crucial piece for those buddies. Yeah, teams. but he he was kind of like Jokic. Like, he didn't really, not a lot of, he could do a, a lot more up top because he could, he was a really good passer. Um, so I, 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 and I know where you're going, but it's just funny to hear you go. Yeah. He was kind of like Jokic. Yeah. He's like, is this racist comparison? Yeah. That's just kind of like an unathletic white guy that, uh, could pass the ball and shoot, (laughs) but he was six ten, So, (laughs) and he could rebound. So, yeah. Um, who do you think the starting five is for OU basketball next year? Oh my God. 
I know it's like, a tough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. Uh, to project who's it. on the roster? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna try to project it. I, I'll operate. Okay. So under- Parker, you're kind of giving away who you think is gonna hit the portal, just so you know by doing this. Not necessarily. Uh, you know what? Maybe. I yeah, am. you are. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. I take it all back. Because by those Yuzan isn't going to be in your prediction, and neither is Owe. I'm just going to – I'll say it for you. I, I take it all back. There you go. So, yeah, as things stand today, as things stand today, we we do not believe things are trending very well. But an NIL donation or two could change some things, right, Parker? Would you agree with that? It could certainly change some things. It could change some things. That's I like college basketball, especially with no current restrictions on transfer. Like Caden Proctor just blew the doors wide open yesterday. Yeah. When he, when his decision, like, and he was brazen about it. He's like, yeah, I'm leaving Iowa. I'm going back to Alabama. Didn't like, he's not even in the portal. He can't even get in the portal yet, but he's already told everybody I'm getting in the portal. Here's where I'm going. It's very clear at this point, And, I feel like we all saw that yesterday. There are no guardrails whatsoever. And when guys can transfer as many times as they want, it is a breeding ground for a mercenary culture. And that's going to be college basketball. To an extent, that will Mm -hmm. be college football. To a much greater extent, that will be college basketball. And guys will make decisions based entirely off of NIL when they get in the portal. They will go where they can get paid the most. And so you're going to have to bag a couple of guys straight up. You're just going to have to be willing to pay more than the others. I mean, for like, OU was getting Oswin Aaron Moon say back in April, the four-star big man in mm-hmm. the 2024 class. Providence and, said not so um, fast. Yeah, my friend. Here comes Providence <laughs> four days before he's going to decide. And they throw an obscene amount of money at the kid. No, you quite quite simply does not have enough to be able to match figures. And so he's a he's a Providence Friar. So yeah, NIL is gonna factor in big. The fact that you just said, oh, you didn't have enough NIL. It's like just with basketball. I like I get it. And you'll never hear those words, those words uttered on the football side or the softball side, right? Yeah. But what and I talked to a source about that is, and this source, let's just say, you probably know who I'm talking about, by the way. Let's just say this source is really, really good and said that the biggest issue they have heard at Oklahoma is that it's still the lack of buy-in to the basketball programs when softball has had two ground up stadiums since I think it was like 95 or whatever. And basketball is still trying to figure out what they're going to do with the stadium in the, and I quote piece of crap Lloyd Noble center. (laughs) And I, I totally agree with that source. Like facts, like what is going on when you go to the SEC? There needs to be some major, and I I think that there, Parker, you and I've discussed this before, and we discussed something here. There's going to be some major buy-in across the board because the donors in the athletic administration do not want to go on to the SEC the first few years and not look like they don't they don't they don't want to look like they don't belong, like they want to look like they belong which means you're probably going to see some money thrown around that notoriously would not have been thrown around in basketball. Notoriously would not have been thrown around in baseball. And it's going to help those programs substantially and make kickstart them into a direction that probably wouldn't be the case if they were staying in the Big 12. As a matter of fact, would not be the case if they were saying the Big 12. Does that make sense? Like yeah. as far as the 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 buy in the do the donor buy in because sure pride starts to get a hold of you right as a donor oh that's my alum like I all my mater I am not gonna let them get their crap kicked in 
going to the SEC, how much do we need to throw in here? Done. Like, let's go make this work. Let's prove that we belong in that conference across the board. So I think that's going to be really, really interesting to see how that plays out. And by the way, yes, I know Spangler was only 6'8". It was just a joke. He was a not-so-athletic big man, white guy that could pass the ball and shoot. But he was a he was a he was a hoss on the boards, regardless. A dude dude could ball. Um. Anyways, all right. I think that should do it right for this version of the OU Insider under the visor YouTube Live. If you are not look, we have there's so much information over there on OU Insider VIP. Go check it out. Team Spring Ball, and we didn't really get to a lot of that because of the recruiting talk. Uh, but if you want team notes, first three practices done, who are the standouts? Who's done really well? Who's moved positions? Who hasn't moved positions? Who's doing um, – who's who's sitting out? Who's doing all that? We have that over there on our board. Parker and I have both dropped just significant amount of notes on that. Like you can go scroll through and see, and there's updates. Uh, probably both 1,500 words piece plus on standouts who's doing what what type of defense do they plan on all of that stuff is right over there OU insider vip we've got it for you plus so many recruiting stuff parker and i will be out and about this weekend i'm in arkansas i'm trying to set up to go see amar and robinson either tomorrow or friday uh and get an update for you all on the board um uh, we've got updates on you as far as uh, the, the tight ends to some brain, Nate Roberts, like so much information. Uh, Jonah, Jonah Williams, five-star safety, new update already up there. Parker has it for you. Like, where do things stand there? Um, Marcus Wimberly, all of that. We got it for you. If you need information on recruiting, OU's top targets, 25, 26, we got it for you. OU Insider VIP, $9.95 a month, $99.95 for the whole year. We'll get you all the way through this point in 2025 this time of the month in 2025 so uh if you want to sign up for a whole year it's worth it also subscribe to this youtube channel daily updates daily videos all retaining to ou athletics football basketball baseball recruiting softball all of the above we've got it for you right here on this channel all right for parker thune for spencer foresight my name is brandon drum that's going to do it for this version of the ou insider youtube live you guys have a blessed night.